your night. Thank you to, to all of you for coming out tonight. Um, when we started on this project four years ago, I didn't know what this film was going to be. I, I thought maybe nobody would even see it, um, but we still wanted to tell the story. And then it kept evolving, it kept getting bigger, it kept scaling, and then all of a sudden, we get a call to world premiere at South by Southwest, and then we get a call from <laughs> the folks at Freep, and they want us to open the festival, and it's just, it, it's been this incredible experience uh, to see this film um, come to life, and, and it couldn't have happened without um, all of you and all of the people who have supported us throughout the process, whether it's people who supported the Kickstarter campaign, um, or invested in the film, or just offered words of encouragement, or folks that participated in the film. People were so gracious and coming out of the woodwork wanting to tell their Korean story, and that's because the magazine had such a profound impact on so many people. Um, and, and I'm just so, so grateful um, to, to be standing here tonight with Scott and the rest of our production team that's, that's out in the audience that worked so hard um, on this. So I really hope you enjoy it. Um, and, and while we, we did have the, the distinct honor of premiering it at South by Southwest, it's always been about Detroit. It's always been about this night with this crowd. And we really hope you've done this story justice because it's for you. It's for you, so I hope you enjoy this story that's about three things. It's about a magazine, it's about a city, and it's about a motley crew of good rock writers gone bad. I hope you enjoy. Enjoy. This one's for you, Pops. Yeah, well, we did, and you got away with it, so. We were, we were definitely kindred spirits, and we liked doing what we're doing, and we did it in Detroit because nobody bothered us here. <laughs> this, this dichotomy that was drawn in the film between Cream and Rolling Stone, these kind of, were you guys real aware of this at the time? Was it a conscious part of your, your mission, in a way? I mean, when you think about the origin story, I mean, we really did take a bite off of Rolling Stone by calling it Cream. I mean, that was not accidental. And they were like, I mean, we, this is an auto town. It's, it's Ford, and, Ford and Chevy, you know? It was like cream and Rolling Stone. We were like neck and neck. And, you know, we tried harder. I mean, all those dualities. But, you know, there's a certain group of people that were attracted to cream. Those non-corporate types, those who didn't like James Hill, those people who wanted everything a little off. So, I mean, I think we, we struck gold by tapping into those types of people. Even, you know, when uh, Barry died, though, Cameron Crowe called me up and said, what can we do to help? We meaning Rolling Stone. I'm like, what do you mean? Are you going to come proofread for us? He said, yeah, if you need it. Okay. No, it's okay, we got it covered. So, Don, as a, as a guy growing up in Detroit, and I guess by this point you were starting to carve out your own music career, but you're a music fan. Uh, what did Cream mean to you, and what was it about the environment in Detroit that you saw that would sort of allow something like this to spring up here? Well, I, I love Cream. You know, I, uh, I'm just, uh, I, I probably shouldn't even be sitting up here except as a representative of people who lived here and, and bought the magazine and, and lived in the milieu. Uh, I thought that, that that fuck you irreverence this kind of resident of the, of the vibe of the city, you know? I mean, it's a very unpretentious place, and if the people uh, don't want to conform to those conventions. And I thought the magazine, it was both hopeful, especially, you know, I think Dave in particular was incredibly uh, uh, hopeful and optimistic and idealistic, and the blend of the two, the cynicism and and the hopefulness. Uh, I thought it really captured the vibe. And, but, and I think you did a great job of capturing it in the film as well. Really, really yeah. Good job. yeah. What, what is your own particular theory? I think we, there are a lot of them that float about, about why Detroit became such an explosive music. combination of having people from really disparate cultures from all, not just from the country, but from all over the world coming here after World War II uh, to find work. And, and the nature of uh, the situation we were all in, which is that it was a one industry town 
I don't remember ever seeing a, a limousine when I was a little kid. There might have been one up parked out at the airport. But there was really no point in driving around like that. Everybody's fate, everyone was, everyone's fate was in the same hands of the, of the auto companies and the, and the economic success of that. And I think that leads to a really honest, unpretentious culture. And because of all the cultures that were here, it's a really rich culture too. And I think that's where all the great music comes from. Well, firstly, my husband Wayne was in the film and he scored the film, but um, when Scott initially and Jan approached Wayne about being interviewed, um, he did not hesitate to agree because he had so much to share on the subject. And, you know, a lot of times people who are in this film get asked to be interviewed on topics that they have just a limited knowledge of and they don't really add that much passion to the story and in this case Wayne jumped at it because he realized that the story had been untold and he wanted to make sure some things were sort of uh, burned in amber after all this time so that was my initial um, interaction and the first time I met JJ really started to understand the family of the Kramers outside of the publication. So when I started to watch the Rough Assembly um, with Wayne in it, um, I realized the narrative was going to become much richer for the emergence of these powerful women who really, even to this moment, are not explored yet that this thing called Cream Magazine in a city called Detroit where things were made at, I mean I come from Youngstown, Ohio and when I was a child Cream to me was magic I had older brothers who would leave it on their dressers and upset my old country Lebanese parents and were like what, you know, what's it like the film said, it was like, might as well have been Playboy, and it was rock and roll personified. So for this thing to come out of Detroit where all you did was make things, it was like the holy land to me, and the 10 year difference between my older brothers and me was, you know, it was a world of life lived. So at eight rather than 18, I was like, this is really um, dangerous. So for me to be involved in the film as a producer and to help this come to um, shape was monumental because I have yet to find a publication about pop culture that has, it was secretly run by women, these powerhouses to my right, who were the drivers behind the, the men who essentially are known for paying the bills at the, at the magazine. And I'm so proud to be part of the emergence of that story. And I'd also like to just note that J.J. Kramer is not only the son of Barry, he's also the son of Connie. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that incredible passion there. Um, the dysfunction of the, the Kramer family um, is as... In, Fascinating to me as the, the, function, the, the dysfunction of the family that is this family of editors. And I really um, harped on that in my notes, probably to the point of, of upset to our production team. But it kind of really felt like um, we are at a time where women who are my age, who are making decisions about film and making decisions about music and making decisions on the quad and making decisions in Congress, feel like well, we've got to find the root of this. And they were risk takers. I mean, what they wrote was um, enough to get them in trouble then, really to get them in trouble now. And that in and of itself is a bit chilling to me that 50 years on, we're um, still discussing it. But wow, what a risk they took. And I love them for it. Film, and they've all been positive reviews, but I've seen a few references to misogyny, which I think is a shame because, you know, sexism is one thing, that's fair. You know, looking back, I wouldn't judge it by today's standards, but, but misogyny, no, I, I didn't see that. And I, 
maybe, I don't know, maybe once or twice. <laughs> more important, the real equality was, is the reason there were so many women and we weren't prejudiced against is that we would all work for 25 bucks a week. And it's well, like it we hundred, worked... It was, it was 100 when I got there. Well, when I got there it was 22.75. Thank you, Charlie Orange, for telling me after taxes. But the fact was, is we had to live on that and, and yeah. because we worked cheap, it was just incidental that we were women. Women, so it actually worked in our favor. I mean, it, the greatest advantage was to interview some rock star who thought you were just a little piece of fluff and didn't realize that there was a mind there and like razor sharp observations. And Sue and I got away with, with everything. Roberta Kruger, who's here, who preceded us, her too. I mean, you know, we were just like the stealth crowd who got there only because we were cheap. <laughs> but everybody well, yeah. And Barry had this, you know, we have to argue with Barry and tell him, no, we're going to do this. And yeah, he told me I was too young and too female to be editor at the time. And I'm like, well, I'm going to do it anyway. It's like I was going to show him. And then he said, okay, you got the job. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you two must have some good anecdotes on these bands. I don't think the backlash, I think it's the front lash. I mean, I remember going in to um, interview Rick Wakeman and he answered the door in the tall and he wouldn't put clothes on. <laughs> So I just sat there and interviewed a guy in a towel, you know, I mean, that happened a lot. It was a little unnerving, but you just had to act as if it didn't matter. I mean, I'm sure Sue had it. Didn't you have a Ted Nugent? Huh? Didn't you have a Ted Nugent story? Yeah, he took us all over his farm and he messed up our car. Well, he messed up Kathy Giesi's, his, her car. But, you know, it's like, it was, it was an advantage to be a woman in that situation more than it was a disadvantage because You'd get more out of them. They would open. The, they would open themselves up more. You know. I mean, Robert Plant and I got into an argument because he. I think I, He said, uh, "Oh, I remember you from the Cream House on Cass." And I said, "I was in high school then." He goes, "Well, excuse me." <laughs> you know, it was all in good fun, and they loved Cream, so it made it really easy to get to them. And we never had any problem usually talking to them. Going through the, the filmmaking process is um, we ran into a, a handful of folks that um, didn't necessarily leave on good terms with my dad um, and didn't get to have the last word and then he went and died and got the last word and they carried a grudge you know 35 years and were refusing to participate in the film for quite some time I'm like I don't know he's been he's been dead a pretty long time, guys might want to get over it, you know. Um, but the beautiful thing was, a lot of these folks ended up participating, although reluctantly, and the whole process was very um, cathartic um, for, for everybody involved. So it, it took a little more work um, coming at it from different angles, whether it was Jan sending an email or me making a phone call. We kind of worked these folks from um, as many different angles as we needed to to get them on screen. Yeah, JJ! This line of work changed in 40-whatever years. It had to be a lot different in 1975, I would think. I, I think access is different. You'd go out on the road with somebody, and you'd be on the road with them for two, two weeks. It's like almost famous, and now you get an hour. So I think, I think that's a detriment to the industry. You know, we, we could really get inside of a rock star and show people what I said in the movie about the stars, cars, that they're not all that different than we are. And um, you really get to know the person. I think that that's changed. I mean, I think that's the most profound and biggest questions to the publicist. Although we all spoke English and she related to him and it came, he, he answered me back that way. But the funny thing was, is I wrote it in the story, you know? So you wouldn't let them get away with stuff like that. And now people do it all the time. You know, it's just... It's, it's really a shame to get, not get to see people in the act of behaving badly because that's where the interesting stuff is. That's right. I, thought, I thought of a backlash that I didn't remember when we were talking about it earlier. Barry Manilow. I ran into Barry Manilow against my will backstage at a gig. I was introduced to him by my friend who was his record rep, Arista, at the time. And when he heard Cream Magazine, he started screaming at me. He said, Creep. Les I'm sorry, I'm going to swear now. Lester Bangs called me a fucking putz. What kind of fucking rag uses a word like putz? 
So I went back to the office the next day and like, thank you, Lester. <laughs> Oh, for whatever I saw, see Barry Manilow's face, I think of him screaming at me. That, that was your public service announcement. That was. Fantastic.